see the three listed here. Click there. Okay. So this morning, uh, thank you for joining me. I'm Ann Yasalanis. I'm the Residential Horticulture Extension Agent and Master Gardener Coordinator with UFIFIS Extension in Polk County. And uh, Julie Shelb, our Florida Friendly Landscaping Coordinator, Coordinator and I offer um, all of these webinars and we are assisted by master gardeners who are helping co-hosts. So they're the ones that are uh, helping us uh, in our chat um, and answering questions and muting you and looking at video and you know turning that off for people and everything. So uh, when you came in, just check and make sure if you look at this slide here on the far left of that kind of black box in the middle of the slide, it shows where you can be muted and unmuted and video on and off. So during the uh, webinar, it would be best that everyone's muted and their video is off and they'll be going through and checking all of that for you. Um, and if you have a question as far as, you know, I can't hear, I, something's wrong with the screen, something like that, maybe you can type that in the chat as we're going along. Um, they will moderate the chat for me there. Um, and then I will take questions at the end. Now this one, I will take questions at the beginning here in a few slides so we can kind of recap from last time. Then we'll move on and do the design principles. And then at the end, I'll answer questions on today's webinar. Um, but really, I don't, I don't want any other questions in the middle. We'll get them at the beginning and end. But you're welcome to type them into the chat at any time. Um, we'll have an evaluation today as well. So we will put that not only in the chat box at the end, but I will email it to you. And then we will also email out um, any links or anything that will help you out. I will try to remember to send the links from last time and from this time um, as well, because some of the stuff will overlap a little bit and help you out, particularly if you weren't at the last um, webinar, something like the, the design guide, um, that will help you out uh, this time as well. Okay. All right, and we are recording these. Um, we'll get you copies of slides and things at the end of the series. Okay, so we are, are, are doing this series, it's three parts to go from the beginning stages of learning how to look at your existing landscape all the way to the final design. Uh, last week we talked about site inventory and analysis, and this week we're gonna move forward into design principles. And so at this point, um, before we move into design principles, does anyone have any comments or questions from last week's webinar on site inventory and analysis? That's a that's a lot. <laughs> so if you've started on it, you may have questions or you may have just started and see you maybe have a couple weeks to work on that one still. But if you have questions on site inventory and analysis that we can, um, that we can answer now, um, you can type them in the chat or uh, you can unmute. Um, so there are some questions about sound. Sue, um, Chris, can you hear me okay? I can hear you fine. Okay. Yeah, check your volume if that's it. Also, uh, I know um, Zoom is funny. Uh, so sometimes people have trouble joining through computer audio and you can call in by phone also to hear and see the slides on your screen. Um, sometimes you have to go out and come back in. I'm not a Zoom expert, so all of those things I would try. Um, uh, and then there's a question about removing the attendee section. Um, you can click out of any boxes such as the chat or the participants or even the kind of grid screen that shows everybody's faces and everything. You can click out of that or even the participants one, you can minimize it or, or just focus on the speaker view just so you know. All right, so if you have questions about inventory and analysis before we move on. Clearly, if you remember them as we're going on, uh, you can ask them at the end too. That's not a problem. Um, and yeah, if you weren't at the first one, after the series is done, we'll get you everything. And so again, after today, I'll send you all of the links to all the publications and plant lists and everything we talked about last time, in addition to the stuff for today. 
So after the end of all three, we'll get everything to you. Okay. I'm gonna minimize my chat unless anybody else has any questions and we'll keep going. But again, you can ask the questions later too, not a problem. All right, so today we're going to move on and talk about design principles. So design principles are the visual qualities that make up a landscape, um, both as to what people see and what they feel when observing the landscape. Um, so we're gonna talk about those. It's the more artistic side of landscape design. We'll have some good pictures today to demonstrate all this. So the first thing we're gonna talk about is functional characteristics of plants. So this is basically what purpose are the plants serving? And they could be structural, they could be focal, or they could be massing. And we're gonna go through each of these individually. So here we have structural plants. Um, so, whoop. so this could be trees or large shrubs, something like that. So if you look in the picture here, for example, what's providing the structure in this landscape? Well, it's a very large tree. You know, it's very prominent in the landscape. Um, it's creating a space. We'll show some more examples here as well. So you can see how the tree is adding structure to the landscape. It's usually something large, prominent, usually the texture and things combined with that structure. And these design principles all work together. So as we talk about structure and form and, and all of that, it all works together to, to give the landscape the look that the designer is going for. Focal points, those can, the focal point in your landscape can be done with a variety of different things. Um, it could be done with color, it could be done with shape, um, it could be done with texture. Uh, sometimes you'll hear someone say um, specimen plant, um, and that's usually, usually there's always exceptions to all of these design principles for sure, but usually they'll say one prominent you know, plant in the landscape. It's, it's a singular plant that's capturing attention. And you can definitely tell in this picture what that plant is. You can tell which one has a unique color. There's only one of them. It has a very distinct shape and texture and um, it's very prominent in this landscape here. So again, uh, you can see focal plants in this landscape while not a singular plant can be done in small massing uh, groups as well. So this is a set of three um, but again, very prominent um, texture, shape, size. And you can see how these, these three plants here in the foreground look a lot different from the other plants um, in the landscape. Massing. So you can mass a lot of different plants in the landscape and, and you should uh, because with massing you're unifying spaces um, and you can do it for a number of different reasons. Maybe you're unifying spaces um, by doing some repetition with massing. So again, we'll talk about repetition later, but you'll see how these principles all kind of wind together in the landscape. And so here we've got massing plants in a very bright color. It's this, this uh, yellow flowered Rebecca here in this picture. And you can see um, by massing color, so massing using the same plant, um, that's our focal point here. So we went from a singular plant that had a very specific texture and shape and color to three plants that were then our focal points. And now we're massing color um, to do the same thing. So we're doing some massing here. Um, I guess we could say there's focal point and just massing for unity and and cohesiveness in the landscape. So there's multiple things being massed here. And for the most part, that's how you're gonna plant, plant most things in your landscape and then have that specimen plant be your standout or focal point. So here in the background, this large set of three crinum lilies are massed. So there's three, that is a mass. In the front, we have some perennials that are masked by color, most likely on the side. And in the front foreground here, you can see some Indian hawthorn. Those are most likely masked as they normally are, but um, there's just different ways to see how color is masked, how 
different sizes and shapes of plants are massed together to create a look in the landscape. When we move into talking about color, there's different ways to use color in the landscape. And most people have some idea, and you might have done this in your site analysis where you, you kind of figure out what colors you like and you don't like in the landscape. Um, I think if you're very unsure, you could look at your, your neighborhood and your, your house style, um, even getting some ideas from how you have things inside your house, colors you like and don't like can be used outside. So typically warmer colors help, help this help appear closer and make a, face, uh, a space feel smaller. And you can see how different colors are used here. These are warm colors, yellows and reds and things like that uh, in the landscape to give it a certain feel. And then the cool colors kind of open up the space, make it feel distance, the space feel larger. And you can see there's a big difference between massing a warm color versus massing a cooler color as well. And typically we want to use a smaller amount of the brightest color. And again, there's exceptions to everything for sure, but we typically want to have a good balance of everything in the landscape. Um, so balancing colors between foliage and flowers and flowers and, and foliage and flowers and flowers. So what I mean by that is, so if we go um, in this, these series of three pictures here, you'll see um, there's, there's different um, colors in that first picture on the left where the colors of the flowers um, coordinate with the colors of, of foliage. Um, and then in the middle, we can see the colors of flowers are co uh, coordinating with the colors of foliage. And then um, also just the colors of flowers together in the landscape. So we've got a lot of that going on in all three pictures. So in the far right, you could see the little pink uh, whirling butterflies. Uh, coordinating with foliage color, right? So, and then on the one in the far left, we've got foliage plants, we've got purple foliage and green foliage, but we also have yellow flowers and red flowers. So there's lots of, lots of color coordinating going on. Um, and again, you know what you like in the landscape, um, but these are some ideas if, if you need some assistance on ways that you can develop a color scheme for your landscape. So um, monochromatic, if that's something you like, top picture there, so everything the same or similar color. Um, that's pretty easy to do even with just greens. So you may have a monochromatic green landscape, but if you vary the colors of greens a bit, it adds interest. Um, analogous, so red, yellow, orange, and then complementary. So we're remembering back to our time of um, using a color wheel, right? So opposite on the color wheel, orange and blue, that's our example, right? And then you can combine them in any way that, that works for you, as long as you kind of refer back to all of these principles. Um, again, there's no correct way to do it. Um, these are just good examples to give you a good um, appealing result for your landscape design. So then we move into line and how that is used in the landscape. Um, straight line and curving line, pretty obvious there of different ways that we could use it. So for example here, this is a landscape with lots of straight lines. Whereas this is a landscape with a lot of curving lines. And again, it just really depends on your style of home, um, your personal preferences, what you like, the structure of the plants that you like to use. I mean, some plants even tend to lend themselves to a more structural, um, more rigid line quality than others that tend to be more drapey and they have lines in them as well. So um, again, just an example of, of the ways that line is used in the landscape. And certainly with any of these, you can combine them. You can certainly have areas where you've got straight lines and curving lines in the landscape. That's, that's not a problem at all. A uh, form is the shape and structure of plants. And we're gonna go through and show you all of these different types of form. Um, and I think just by glancing at this slide really quickly, you can kind of get an idea of, okay, this, this plant tends to look more formal. So if we look at that columnar, um, which would be an evergreen plant there on that top left picture, the columnar or the pyramidal, um, those look a little more formal, right? Than maybe a weeping or a mounding type of a plant. But if you look at all of those across the top there, and you see in that bottom picture how they're combined in the landscape, you certainly can go for the columnar pyramidal 
shape and look for your landscape to get a more formal look, or you can go more weeping and spiky and vase shaped, but you can also combine them together to have a really um, uh, attractive looking landscape. So looking at here at form, uh, looking at massing. So this picture here shows um, Asiatic jasmine as a ground cover. I think we talked about that last time. So uh, ground cover and shrubs, you could get clumping or matting, spreading, sprawling, short spikes. Again, it kind of depends on what you're looking for in your landscape, but those are some of the forms you would find in ground covers and shrubs. Um, in individual plants, this might be something that you're looking for. Um, could be a, um, our specimen plant or focal point, maybe the spiky or the upright could be that. Um, or just combining some of these together. Certainly you could have, you know, a combination of three or four arching plants together in the landscape for sure. And then looking at texture, this is important as we combine it with things like form, um, because when you're combining texture with form, you really get a lot of different looks of plants in the landscape. So um, coarse plants, maybe a coarse plant with a spiky texture, you know, that to me says um, tropical focal plant, you know, something really strong in the landscape. Whereas if I'm looking at a fine textured, you know, perennial in a pollinator garden, that's, that's just a very different look. Um, and you can certainly, again, combine them cr across different textures in a lot of really fun ways. So here looking at some of the coarse textured plants and their qualities. So with a coarse textured plants, usually they have larger foliage, rough surfaces, maybe irregular shapes. Um, spiky is very common, um, maybe thick branches, larger size, and you can see that in, in some of these plants here. You know, thick leaves, um, large shapes of leaves, that sort of thing, rigid texture. Medium texture, so kind of an average foliage size. Maybe this would be something that'd be like a foundation plant that you're massing throughout your landscape. Could have slightly rough textures, neither dense or open branching. So, you know, just kind of that standard shrub in your landscape. So um, if you look at the picture on the bottom, um, the shrubs, there's, you can kind of see three of them on the left side there. The um, Schilling's Dwarf Holly would be a good example of, you know, just kind of the regular size shrub, medium texture, and then in that same bottom picture there, we've got a large Fakahatchee grass that, that really is more of the focal point and that medium textured plant kind of falls to the background. And with fine texture, usually you see that more in your perennials, thin strap-like foliage, delicate flowers, delicate foliage, more thin stems, could be light and wispy. And I think you can see that from the photos there. So here you can see a combination of different um, textures used in the landscape and just that you get a very different feel um, from those different textures. And also, I mean, as you look at these two, think about form and color and all those, how they impact the look of that landscape that you see. Um, perceived size of space. So this could be important if you're trying to do something particular in your landscape. So um, if you have a, a, a um, a yard that you want to make look bigger or a big yard you want to make more cozy, these things could be important to you. So um, larger um, when fine texture is far away. So if you look at the picture on the top right there, the, the large shrub, kind of the highest one on the left side is fine textured. Um, so it's gonna make a space feel more open. Whereas in the bottom picture, when the coarse texture is furthest away from the, the eye, it makes the space seem smaller. So you can think about that as you're, you know, referring back to maybe some of the design work you've started that, you know, oh, I want to enclose this vacant space and make it feel cozy when I sit out here in the evening, you know, in a chair or something. So, okay, maybe I need to choose my large shrubs with some sort of coarse texture. Um, that could help you make those decisions. In addition to that, the size of the plant or object um, in the surroundings. And I think you can really see that in that that hand drawing there um, as far as enclosing a space or opening up a space and how that's used. And then going into unity. So you'll hear some of the things that we just talked about. 
So unity is really important in a landscape. I know I say mass plantings are repetition and we don't want everything the same in the landscape, right? But we have to have some sort of repetition or at least some small areas of mass plantings, similar colors and textures in the landscape to tie everything together. So with our unity, we can do that through mass plantings of the same thing repeating that throughout the landscape, or even repeating the use of diff the, the same forms, the same textures, and the same colors. Um, so you can group or mass several plants of the same species together instead of placing them separately in the landscape, and then intersperse shrub areas with lower ground covers and trees. So again, just something as simple as mass planting three, um, three ferns. Here, kunti cycads are used a lot um, for unity. They are real easy because you can unify a landscape that kind of ranges from sun to shade because they do well in both sun and shade. So they're really easy to, to mass plant in groups of three or six or even more um, in different areas of the landscape, whether sun or shade. So this is a good example of, of a plant that works well for that. And there are certainly a lot more as well. Um, looking at balance, so symmetrical or asymmetrical, what, what's your, um, your preference there? And again, it doesn't matter. It's just something that you can, can look at when you're creating a design. It is important, though, that you do look at the proportions of the plant. So when we, uh, at the very end, talk about, about, about selecting plants for your yard, it's really important that you look at that um, mature size of the plant that you're selecting and you should be able to find that in all of our information in our plant guide um, because you want to make sure that you've selected a plant that works well with um, the size of your property the size of your house um, this is showing a poor example in that we've got a really large tree right up against the house so it does a great job making your house look really small this would be a better suited tree to um, for maybe along the back fence of this same property and something smaller would work here. So always refer to those, those sizes uh, when you're selecting plants. We have a lot of transitions in the landscape um, and you can see a number of them here in this photo as an example. So we have changes in color and texture and height. So again, this picture shows all of them pretty easily. We can see the changes in height um, typically in the landscape, not always, right? We have our lawn area and then we start with a lower ground cover and everything gets higher as we move to the back of the landscape. And it could be that the highest part is as we get to the, to the edge of the house, right? Or it could be to the edge of the fence or to the edge of the property or the middle of the landscape bed, something like that. You can also see here the change in color um, and the way that it adds interest to the landscape. Um, and you can imagine different colors in here. So this has very similar colors, those kind of red shades, but if you had one red and one yellow, you'd get a different look. Or if everything here was a different shade of green, or imagine even some different textures. We've got a lot of fine textures here, but what if that kind of second layer there was, um, you know, a very coarse texture? It would look a lot different. Here's another example of transition. In that picture on the right, you can see, again, our lowest point is our that brick walkway there and then moves up into a ground cover and then up into um, uh, some ornamental grasses there. And you can see the different textures that are used and the different colors that are used in that to get a different feel of the landscape. Um, so typically you'll see here those different layers, the ground cover, the foreground, we have that mid-ground of our, maybe our shrubs or our ornamental grasses that are a little bit bigger, and then our background, which are gonna be our taller shrubs. Here's another example of something very similar. Again, the, the highest point here would be the fence. So then you can see how it steps down into that lawn space. Um, when we look at repetition, so, we talked about doing that with those mass plantings. I mentioned that Kunti cycads are really good about that. Um, and the reason that we do that is to, to discourage clutter in the landscape. Um, so it's fine to have, you know, fun plants, focal points, specimen plants, and that sort of thing, but they really get lost in the clutter if you don't have those repeated plants, the repeated, um, you know, massing of 
you know, shrubs and that sort of thing. So it's important that you do a little bit of repetition in that landscape. Focalization is important. Um, so with doing that, we talked about the focal plants. You can do it in a couple of different ways. So drawing a viewer's eye to the focal point in the landscape. If you think about people that paint their front door a bright color, you want, you know, and you look at that house, that's where your eye goes first, right? And you can do that here. They've done it with um, repeating the standard crepe myrtles on either side of the front door. And then there's mass plantings of pentas. They're both, you know, bright red there. So it's, they've kind of done this with a couple of different things. So they've repeated the plants, they've got that structural form, and then the color also helps with that focalization. So it doesn't have to be just one plant. Um, you can do it in a couple of different ways, which is interesting. You can also do it if you're going to be considering adding any um, garden art or ornamentation into the landscape. Um, you can certainly do that to, to create a focal point, and that's done here with a small sculpture. Here it's done with a couple of different things, which is interesting. So um, not only does it have that focal point of color, right, bright yellow, but also that ornamentation as well. So um, two things have created a focal point in this landscape. So as we work through um, these, these design principles, um, there's a few things we want to try and avoid. Um, so this can kind of be your checklist. So after you're working through your design and thinking about combining things, you can refer to this before and then maybe after too, you can go through and go, okay, uh, did I do any of this? Okay, I did. I better go back through and, you know, double check and, and take care of some of this stuff. Um, so the first one would be over planting or planting too closely. And if we're drawing everything on our plan to scale, which we'll talk about next time, we will make sure that if we follow our plan that we are not planting too closely. So over planting or planting too closely can be a huge problem later. And that might be some of the reason that you have to do redesign now is because things are just too crowded and over planted. Um, so when we're installing plants in a new landscape, they should not look how they should look in five years. That means they're too crowded now. There should be plenty of space in between them. Too many different kinds of plants. I think as you start to move forward with your landscape design, you'll start to notice where you have mass plantings. You could even do that and remind yourself to do that through your design process by doing, you know, some shading of different colors. So, you know, grab a green crayon or marker or colored pencil or something and say, okay, well, I'm going to make sure that I have my, for example, Kunti cycads. I'm going to put them out in this front bed. I'm going to put them along the front of the house and in this other area too. And you can just kind of shade sections where you know you want mass plantings to build those, those focal points off of. Uh, the lawn cluttered with trees and shrubs. So if you have a lot of existing trees and shrubs or even are considering planting more, if you're taking kind of a look at your plan and what you have and see that, oh, in my lawn, it's just there's a tree here and here and here, and they're kind of scattered all over the place. Um, ideally, what would, would work best, not to remove them, but to just kind of incorporate them into a larger mulched bed makes it a lot easier to maintain. It's a lot easier to mow around one big bed with a lot of trees in it versus you know, 20 different small circles with trees in them. It also kind of cleans up the landscape and makes it look a lot neater. Um, truthfully, you don't even need to plant anything extra in it. It's just, a, you know, larger mulch beds kind of encompassing all that existing stuff. Try and avoid those shrubs too tall for the structure like we just talked about. Also consider planting groups by their water needs. So um, we're not talking too much about irrigation um, in this webinar. But it is important to think that these plants will have to be watered. Um, if you have an existing sprinkler system, your sprinkler system is broken up into zones. And we want everything in this zone. So zone one waters in set amount, right? And so if it's watering a set amount, we want everything in that zone to, to require the same amount of water. Otherwise, some, somebody's always getting underwatered or overwatered. So consider that as you're, you're adding plants to your landscape, and we'll talk more about plants next time. Uh, try to avoid plants too close to the house. So your plan will help you with that too, because you can draw those plants in, showing a significant space. So ideally what we wanna do is have the mature size of our plant 
um, we're drawing that mature size in, right? Even if we buy a one gallon plant that's six inches tall now, we know it eventually will be six feet around. We wanna space it so that when it's mature, that the edge of the plant doesn't touch the house and is at least about 12 inches away, okay? And then avoid bright colors scattered in the yard. So if we've done a pretty good job of creating unity and doing some mass plantings, if you're doing any of that you know, shading of your green uh, foundation plants that you're gonna have everywhere, that'll help you kind of figure out, okay, well, I've got, I've got some areas shaded of green. I know I have you know, good areas where my landscape is gonna be unified and, and look really neat. Um, and here's where I can, can place in some areas of bright color rather than having it kind of randomly scattered. And then additionally, we want to avoid any narrow strips of grass. So if right now you're doing a lot of playing around with um, creating landscape beds and all of that, just double check um, your measurements and even, you know, going out into the yard and, and, and doing some real life measuring, make sure you don't leave any areas Again, we kind of talked about this last time where either a mower can't access or it's so narrow, like in this photo here, um, it's really hard to maintain and much less water, um, a very small section of grass right there. Um, it'd be better if you have a, a situation like in this photo, if you just kind of incorporate that tree into the landscape bed, it just makes maintenance a lot easier. <clears throat> 